Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this call today. I'm really excited to have this conversation and get to know each of you a little bit better. Let's start with a round of introductions. So my name is Ashley. I support with education and marketing at ETE. Um, Willie, how about yourself? GM, everybody. My name is Willie. Currently, I'm head of decentralization for the Fox Foundation, which is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to supporting the Shapeshift DAO and achieving full decentralization. Previously, I was a product manager at Shapeshift since 2018. Um, also in my free time, I'm, I love DAOs and crypto and I enjoy contributing to give it um, a blockchain for social good DAO. And I'll pass to, to Daniel. GM, sir. Sweet, GM, GM, thanks, Willie. Um, so, my name is Daniel. I am a steward at Ichi uh, and also work uh, at DMA Labs, uh, very focused on creating deep liquidity for projects, creating infrastructure for DAOs to be able to build and create liquidity for their tokens. Um, previously, I was a product manager at IBM working on some of their more uh, centralized private permission blockchains like Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and before that, I was working on scaling Bitcoin uh, back back in the day, um, in the good old days when uh, side chains was a was a thought for scaling Bitcoin. So uh, good good times back then. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Mr. Lior, GM Sir. GM, thank you. It's GM here, but uh, yeah. So yeah, so my name is Lior. I'm head of platform at Collider Ventures today, which means that I'm in charge of supporting our portfolio companies after we invest in them. So we take a very active approach with the companies uh, we invest in as web free uh, narratives goes with the value goes to those who create it. So we want to be there with the founders and, and the teams that uh, uh, that we choose to, to invest and be there along, alongside them when they need us. And so this is basically what I'm doing. Previously, I've been so I started my crypto journey full time in 2018 when I joined the DAO stack. We've been building DAO infrastructure back then when DAOs were not a thing yet, but uh, uh, we were probably right on the idea, not that right on the execution. Uh, but that led me into the rabbit hole of like being involved in many DAOs and trying to contribute uh, from my experience in BizDev growth and DAO to DAO. Uh, and this is where I also know these two folks here. Uh, part of this journey was also being a contributor within the, the Ichi DAO and helping on initial growth with their first product. And here we are now. Yeah. And I pass it back to you, Ashley. Thank you so much. Well, it's really nice to hear everybody's um, backgrounds and, and kind of the way that you've come into the space. I always like to see what people did before. And, um, you know, I was a teacher before. I just joined Web3 in January of this year. So coming up on my one year anniversary of the deepest rabbit hole that I didn't know existed. And um, it's been really, really fun. I've learned a lot and continue to do so. So I'm excited to chat with you all. So let's kind of jump into um, the shit show, for lack of a better word, um, that has been the the sentiment this past few months with um, just project over project kind of crumbling and, and people running around panicking like the sky is falling. Um, I'd love to hear kind of your perspective in more specifically the FTX fallout, like what have we learned uh, from this event and and any thoughts you have uh, moving forward? So we can kind of just let whoever is ready to jump in and we'll feed off of each other from there. Cool. Oh man, what a shit show. I think that's the perfect word to describe <laughs> what happened. Um, yeah, at Shapeshift, we've always advocated strongly for self-custody. In fact, that's why Shapeshift was first started. Uh, it was in 2014 in the wake of Mt. Gox, which was like the first big centralized exchange to get hacked. And the first time that people really learned the lesson the hard way that if it's not your keys, it's not your crypto. So we've always at Shapeshift focused on making it easier for people to actually practice self-custody. And um, yeah, I mean, if you think back in 2014, uh, obviously one of the biggest or one of the most common use cases currently in crypto is trading. And back in 2014, before Shapeshift, it was not possible to trade without using these centralized exchanges. And there weren't even that many cryptos. It was like Bitcoin and Litecoin initially. Um, so um, 
it's not super surprising that, you know, initially kind of the status quo was for people to leave their crypto on exchanges. And since 2014, we've come quite a long way in actually enabling a lot of these use cases that previously were only accessible on centralized exchanges and making those accessible to absolutely anybody and enabling people to actually trade and earn yield and do all this fun crypto stuff um, while maintaining self-custody and control of their crypto. So, um, I think we're hopefully getting to a point where it's now possible to not use a centralized exchange to do a lot of the activities that users want to do in crypto. Of course, they're still needed for on and off ramping. So I like the the latest meme of, um, you know, treat centralized exchanges like a public restroom. Get in, get out as quickly as you possibly can. I think that's a, a great words of wisdom to live by. And my hope is that as uh, DeFi continues to evolve and uh, platforms and interfaces like Shapeshift continue to make it easier for people to maintain self-custody and just advances in, in protocols um, such as um, the smart contract wallets that enable social recovery and things like that. So it makes it actually easier for, for users to um, to practice self-custody and to um, to minimize risk of losing your, your keys because that is one thing that isn't always talked about but is, is very true which is that with great power comes great responsibility. And basically, if you're not maintaining your own keys, or if, yeah, if you're responsible for maintaining your own keys, then there is still risk. And it, um, it's now up to you to basically secure those keys and make sure you don't lose your backup or that that the backup isn't compromised. So yeah, I'm optimistic as usual that um, hopefully this latest uh, debacle is a, a, a learning lesson and um for yeah, for anyone who was leaving their funds on CFI, and that hopefully over 2023 and the coming years, we'll start to see this this trend continue, which we've seen over the past month of a lot of users actually migrating away from CFI, withdrawing their funds, um, depositing them into DeFi. Um, I'm hopeful that that trend continues, um, but it's up to entrepreneurs and projects like us to basically build the infrastructure and, and uh, build the experiences and make it as easy. Uh, as CFI, so that hopefully um, the yeah the liquidity starts to migrate, and ultimately I think that's what we need is we need more liquidity to migrate from CFI to DeFi to make it even better um, in every way, shape, and form, so that there's just no excuse to continue using CFI, uh, other than maybe the on and off ramps, and who knows, maybe we'll even figure out a way to decentralize that one day as well. Yeah, Willie, I love I love the public restroom idea uh, and and reference. Uh, totally totally agree with you there. Um, yeah, I think, I think exactly like Willie said, right. Even for, uh, we have like some major OGs here, you know, uh, Lior from, from Dow stack, which was trying to do infrastructure for DAOs back in the day, Willie from shapeshift, who's dealing with trying to figure out decentralization early in the days of, of decentralization when centralized exchanges were the only way to kind of deal with crypto and get crypto. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think we're kind of getting to that point where we're hopefully enabling all these decentralized services to uh, allow people to use them in a pretty simple format in a simple way, you know, slowly getting a better, much better customer and, and uh, just, you know, general user experience to the point where people will be able to do all of this um, through self custody. Um, exactly. Like Willie said, a lot of the issues are, um, self-custody is, you know, lacks a lot of safety, lacks a lot of, uh, simplicity for people. Uh, and it's really easy to go and use an on-ramp through a centralized exchange versus going and on-ramping with, you know, today, a credit card into a random app, um, and not being sure how to, how to move over funds. Uh, you know, back in the day, you even had to keep keys, your, your private keys on, on pieces of paper, like people did all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but, you know, I think one of the biggest uh, pros and positives and things that are coming out of this is people are realizing that um, centralized exchanges are, are kind of traditional finance, just moving over into the crypto space with these, with these tokens, right? Um, we, that's not what we want to do. We want to innovate. We want to create decentralized infrastructure. We want people to be able to, um, simply and comfortably hold and self custody, self custody, their, their tokens and, and their, their assets in general, um, and have that be simple. Um, today, you know, custodians, whether they're centralized exchanges or, or other kinds of institutions are 
definitely needed at this point from a technological perspective um, in for, for the mass you know retail user to be able to onboard into the space. But um, I'm hoping step by step, right, we'll be able to actually onboard people. We see a lot of like advancements in tech around uh, MPC, right? Um, MPC wallets, multi computational, uh, multi party computation, sorry, um, which is sort of focused on not having to deal with holding private and public keys. We have all kinds of like innovations that, that you know, hopefully are going to push the space forward. So, um, totally agree with Willie, right? Decentralized and self custody is is the right path, but um, I think we we have some more steps to make it simple for everyday average users to be able to do this and not have uh, only the power users uh, deep in in the weeds and uh, using this stuff. Yeah, and I, I, I think I, I agree, and I think maybe taking a a, a bit of pragmatic approach. That I always like to think of things. Uh, uh, through lens of time so it's not like zero or one like we started with the vision that everything should be decentralized and everything from day one should be self custody but we've seen that it does uh, come in contrast to adoption in contrast to, to easy of use and events like the FTX uh, collapse does uh, do, do raise a red flag but I think I, I just saw today that out of 20 billion volume in 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 token trading volume, only 1.5 was uh, done on on, on DeFi like today. So we are still far from kind of learning this, the lesson, and like you know, it means that there are still obstacles to get there. So what I believe that we'll see, and we already see this with account obstructions and layers and tools like Daniel mentioned, that will give us gradually more ability to give DeFi uh, capabilities with the experience of, of CeFi. So I, I, don't, I don't see CeFi or central exchange disappear, but gradually we see them being accountable to show, for example, proof of reserves or showing some evidence of uh, solvency. And I think the more we will we'll go that path, we will also see them integrating DeFi. Uh, so the only maybe uh, function that they, they do, they may, it's maybe the KYC and maybe the legal stuff to onboard the people, but then you know that even you use the, uh, the, the, the exchange to trade, you are still in control of your custody, or at least you know what the, 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 the exchange is doing with your money. And I guess that it will also, I, I don't guess, I, I know that it will get to the point that we will have also decentralized KYC solutions. So there will be networks that help people to to keep their own identity on a decentralized solution, but that will take time. It will take more adoption, more regulation to, to get there. But I think that like step-by-step, step, we've seen that most more layers of the stacks are getting to that point that people are uh, using uh, uh, trustless systems that gives more confidence to the user and more uh, transparency about uh, what's going on underneath. So yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think one piece there is that we're kind of like in the gray area of like the move between centralized and decentralized exchanges. Um, and we're at that point where the decentralized space might not have exactly like Lior said, right, the, the, the good experience, the centralized experience, but the centralized space doesn't even have the right amount of um, of, of regulation or, uh, you know, it, people keep talking about proof of reserves, but a way to make, make sure that the funds that are being put in there are actually held by that exchange or by that custodian. Um, so we're in this middle ground where people are like, okay, DeFi is kind of tough because I can't, I don't know exactly how to hold my crypto in the best way or in the safest way. And then I go to centralized exchanges and I'm like, well, I don't even know if I put my money here that it's really going to be safe. Um, so we're at this kind of crossroads where we need better, you know, proof of reserves and regulation in the CFI space. We need better regulation overall in CFI and DeFi, um, but we also need like better, simpler experiences in in uh, DeFi. So, yeah. Um, yeah. What one thing to note, I do think oftentimes, like once you get over the, once you are on ramp into crypto, DeFi in many ways is very easy. Like if you compare the experience of going to a bank to get a loan versus going to a, a DeFi protocol to get a loan, I would argue that it's actually in many ways easier. Um, 
once you have some base level of knowledge and once you get through the gate, it's like, that's the hardest part of, of getting to the party is getting through the bouncers, getting through those on-ramps, doing the KYC. And then once you're in crypto land, it's it's pretty smooth sailing. But to your point also, the um, uh, I think DeFi is a little bit scary as well. Like just depositing your funds into a smart contract for an average user. Um, and you hear these stories about these huge $100 million hacks and everything, and that scares people. And to be fair, um, you know, DeFi, there, there, there are rug pulls, there are scams, and even contracts that are audited and stuff, oftentimes we still have these vulnerabilities and these exploits that occur. So um, I think hopefully we're starting to see that um, a tipping point where at some point people are realizing that, you know, CFI is great and, it, oh, it's regulated, but even when it's regulated, like the, the funds may or may not actually be there. Um, and with DeFi, at least you can see the funds on, train, on chain, you can audit the code, at some point, I do think that we'll see a shift where the, the risk-free rate or the safer bet um, for equal yields is in DeFi because these contracts are not only audited, but battle-tested. They hold billions of dollars in, in TVL. And um, eventually, like once these institutions realize that, okay, wait a second, DeFi actually is more secure. It is safer um, than CeFi, and it becomes worth it for them to, to migrate their liquidity once we see more liquidity in DeFi and we see people trusting these DeFi protocols more, that's, I think, going to be essential and hopefully a nice catalyst for this shift from, from CeFi to DeFi. But I agree with Lior, there, there, there could still be a role for, for CeFi, especially as long until the regulations evolve and it's the only way to on and off ramp. Um, but I would like to see that, that role minimized to on and off ramping because in all of the other aspects, I do think that DeFi has the potential to be much better than CeFi and where CeFi can't really compete because it's... Um, we, it can't have that same level of transparency and trust or even better trustlessness. So, um, but obviously a big missing piece is that liquidity. And, um, but once the liquidity migrates, it's like, I really do see a future in which DeFi can be better than CeFi in every shape and form and where CeFi really can't compete. It's starting. It's starting. We're seeing the, uh, it's happening. we're seeing the, the money migrate. <laughs> There's like what, like $9 billion moved out of, uh, out of Binance last week, right? Like in stables and ETH, it was crazy. Um, yeah, maybe it's time for, for DeFi summer round two. We need some liquidity mining, really juice up those incentives for, for people to migrate. But who knows, we'll, we'll see. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, there were a few things there. Um, I, I feel like I, I heard a lot of like, we need clear education and an, a, a better user experience for most people. And I think, you know, largely the, the regulatory frameworks that we need are present. It's just there's a lack of equitable application enforcement and oversight. And um, DeFi definitely makes that so much easier. So hopefully those um, evolutions will come. But I, I wanted to ask a little bit more about user experience from your perspective. So at Uniswap recently like updated their privacy policy where they just shared that they were in a, in a really transparent way, they're going to start collecting more user data so that they can update their user experience and they wanted to make data-driven decisions. And there was a lot of pushback from that because people are like, well, a big tenant of Web3 is that I have sovereignty over my data and I have a right to privacy. And so if we are going to focus our efforts for adoption on making ease of use better and kind of updating the user experience for everyone, do we need to be gathering data in that way to, to make that happen? Um, are there ways to make data-driven decisions that don't involve you know, tracking device and cookies and things along those lines? Oh, I love this question. Um, so I'll go, I'll just jump in there because we, we've got a pretty cool story of this at Shapeshift. Um, I love Uniswap, but I was really disappointed to see them collecting all that data. I think it's really easy to say, oh, you know, we need this data to improve our product. Um, but that's a very slippery slope, right? And where do you draw the line? And um, I, I really, you know, I would hope that protocols like Uniswap that are really kind of the, the blue chips in the industry and um, that it, that those protocols would really go above and beyond to set good examples and high standards. And I, I really was disappointed to see how much data they're collecting. So at Shapeshift, we've we've had this uh, battle before, all in public, because we really are a DAO. I'm like, I don't know, I'm not quite sure if we can really see those debates uh, happening behind Uniswap's closed doors. I would love to. But um, yeah, at Shapeshift, there was a uh, kind of some competing ideals. And we had an initial proposal almost a year ago to add analytics to the new open source app. And um, it was very controversial. And there was one camp that said, you know, we need this data so that we can compete with all these other 
applications that are private, they're closed source, and they're collecting even more data. Um, and we need to have at least some data so that we can make informed decisions. We can't just be completely blind, which is where we were about a year ago. And uh, on the other side, it was the um, you know the crypto crypto ethos of let's be fully private, let's be different, let's let's do this the way it should be. Like, uh, could this data help? Maybe, but that's okay. Like, we can do it without the data, and, and that'll that's how we should do it. So um, that led to some really interesting debates. I know the first proposal that went up to Ad Analytics actually got voted down, and um, it got retracted by the initial proposer. And um, after some great open discussions with the community we aligned on a compromise and the new proposal went up to add analytics, but they make them completely opt-in. So you can see this right now. If you go to app.shapeshift.com and you click connect wallet, you'll see a modal that asks you to opt into sharing anonymized usage data. So even the data that we were collecting, it was far less than what Uniswap was collecting, but it really was like the core data that we needed to make in informed decisions. So um, the proposal was to not track IP addresses or any personal uh, personal identifiable information, but purely um, anonymized user IDs and page views and clicks. So we can see from an individual user, we have no idea who they are, but we can see which pages they viewed and which things they clicked. And we get aggregate data of like, okay, this many users are visiting this page, this many users are clicking this button, here's where they're dropping off, um, which I think is a really nice balance. It gives us the core information that we really need to make informed decisions, but users are opting in. Um, we're not collecting any personally identifiable information. So it's all anonymized. And um, users, if they opt out, they have the opportunity to use private.shapeshift.com. So for the crypto users that really care about privacy, don't want to share any information whatsoever, they can use private.shapeshift.com and we have no idea what's going on there. Uh, we don't even see those page views or clicks. So um, yeah, and we have no idea how many users are even using it right now. But what we do know is that enough users are happy to share this anonymized data that it's, it gives us more than enough statistical significance to be able to make informed decisions. Um, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. And like, that's that's what I would like to see projects like Uniswap adopting. Um, because again, like I really don't think they need all that information to make informed decisions. And there's very good arguments for why they shouldn't be storing all of that information in centralized places. Like that's, that's why we're here. Um, so yeah, that's one example of how I think DAOs can DAO better. And yeah, I would I would I would push for Uniswap to really go above and beyond and not just accept data because they can, but actually accept the minimal amount of data that they actually need. Um, and yeah, which I would say is anonymized pages and clicks should be plenty for them. Yeah, and I I totally agree with, with Willie. And I think like similar to how I respond to the first question, it's there is a journey in which there is a gap in, in the market for protocols or, or dApps that want to know more about the users, but they don't have the trustless tools that allow them to do that. So in that kind of uh, bridging period that who knows how long it will take, that there is kind of a, uh, a trade-off to, to be made. But I think we also see in this space a lot of projects doing uh, a lot of tooling that will allow dApps to integrate with uh, with both uh, insights and analytics that gives them enough information, but with the consent of the user. And the biggest uh, difference is that the user is the one holding that information. So the user at any given point is the one to give consent. Okay, I want to allow this protocol now to see my trade history or which applications did I use. And this is very aligned to the way DeFi and, and the entire space is, is, is going into it in where uh, users are in control, users are in their in decision. If they want to, to share, maybe they get more rewards or maybe they share, they get uh, advertised adver advertisement that they like to see. So they do this, doing this, but they are not forced to do. And I think uh, both William and Daniel knows who I'm talking about, but there are many uh, projects uh, that are kind, kind of building to that solution. And I think it will be like we are in a bear market. So, so this is the time where projects are looking to integrate these innovative solutions. So when we get to the next phase of, of, a, of a bull market, they are fully functional. And then users do not have to compromise on in terms of privacy and, and uh, giving up on private information. Well said, Lior. Yeah, I get really excited about, about those advancements that kind of give um, both both sides to the party the, the the best of both worlds like because there is there is benefits to being able to collect data and make informed decisions on it like we wouldn't have um platforms like amazon and stuff if they weren't able to collect this data um and i, I like amazon and i like the fact that twitter is free and, and is this amazing uh, ecosystem and that the tweets that it shows me are usually pretty relevant tweets 
So I do look forward to a future in which like um, a user can share things like their demographics, for, for instance, um, with a, a project and maybe get rewarded for it, like you're saying. Um, so the project gets all the data that they they want, but they don't necessarily know like, okay, here's a specific individual that we can identify. Um, I'm looking forward to that. And I think you're right, like that type of stuff is inevitable and will be better for, much better for users in the current status quo. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, they basically nailed it on the head here, right? We're in, in, we're basically, again, similar to the first question, we're in this gray area or transition period, right? From a centralized exchange to a decentralized exchange, right? That period where you're shifting from, um, you know, having custody and having the experience that you can, uh, that makes it simple for you to hold a crypto. In this case, right, where we're kind of in that transition period where uh, in Web 2, we're used to having people just take all the data they want without asking questions um, and, and using that to provide people with these free services online. Now we're kind of shifting more towards this Web 3 space where uh, data is actually a lot more essential to people. People understand that it's very important uh, and that it can be monetized, uh, but is also extremely important for privacy. Um, so we're, we're again in that transition period where we're trying to figure out the best way to implement both the ethos of, of blockchain, kind of like what Willie said, right? Where, which is the privacy of this data and then anonymity of the data, um, but also bring in insight so that we can create that deep um, user experience that people want. So we can understand, hey, people do like that I've implemented this feature or people don't really care about it. I should get rid of it so that users could get the best experience possible. Um, so I think what's super interesting is that we're always innovating. We're, we're in this trans transformative period where we're innovating and learning as we're building this out. Um, but um, but yeah, you know, you, you have people like Shapeshift taking, you know, one stance, you have Uniswap taking a different stance. Um, I'm sure over the next few years, we're going to learn best practices in kind of this new Web3 space and implement hopefully the best thing that'll uh, enable the experience to be great, but also uh, give people the choice of uh, anonymity if they want, of privacy if they want, um, and the ability to monetize that 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 data if they want. Um, so a little bit of everything, hopefully. Um, but I really, I really do believe that we're going in the right direction. And that um, we're we're getting more and more of the of the best minds um, in the world to really jump in and, and build that experience for people. Well, well said. One other example I want to share that I think is super relevant is um, to both Shapeshift and Uniswap is this KYC data for trading. And I think that is like one perfect example of where like data collection and, and the regulations are completely broken. Um, Shapeshift initially didn't require any KYC to trade uh, just because money or crypto was not yet treated as money. So Shapeshift did not have to comply by as a, as a money service business and all of the difficult um, headaches that come along with that. Um, and then 2018 came along, regulations had evolved, and our lawyers basically came to the conclusion that in order to continue operating, at least in the United States, Shapeshift had to start requiring KYC and requiring to collect this very private information from our users and attach that, you know, to their to their crypto addresses and transactions that we did not want to collect whatsoever, uh, and that wasn't really useful for us by any, uh, in any way. Um, but these regulations are supposed to exist to, to protect people. That's the reason for it. But um, this is a perfect example of how regulations can backfire. And now companies that really in crypto, there's there's no need for um, this personal identifiable information, like Shapeshift operated fine without it. Um, and we then were required to collect it and store all this information. And it creates a honeypot. And time and time again, we've seen these uh, this information leaked, um, which is terrible. Like, um, um, cre it creates risk for each one of these these users that didn't want to give the information, but but were required to by these regulations. And Uniswap, um, pretty much, we were so inspired when we saw Uniswap because they were kind of achieving the original vision of Shapeshift of enabling a user to practice self custody and easily swap one asset for another without any account, even better than Shapeshift was. And it was because they were purely an on chain protocol. Um, and so that was very inspirational for us. And we adopted, we embraced. Decentralized exchanges, we sunset our own trading engine, and we were able to stop requiring KYC, which then enabled us to transition to a DAO. Um, so it was all thanks to to crypto that we were able to do that. And yeah, I think so. 
it's it's a little bit sad to see kind of Uniswap go back from that. They created this protocol that doesn't require any personal identifiable information, and they chose to implement data collection on their front end. Um, I'm glad they're not requiring KYC or anything like that or, or collecting that optionally. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a perfect example to show how these regulations can backfire. And um, even if you don't necessarily want to collect this data, sometimes a lot of these projects in the crypto space are actually required to for compliance reasons. And, and I, I want to continue from where we ended, like in terms of regulation, I, I like to look at it that regulation solve problems in the short term, but in the long term technology will resolve. And, and this is kind of the gap we are in. There is not yet the, the regulation or maybe the standards in the market to how do you do uh, data collection. And therefore, we, we know that we need regulation to kind of uh, uh, do things uh, right. But longer term, we, we know that this industry knows how to kind of create standards of, of, for example, like there was like the ICO boom and then people realized that it, it doesn't work and that's not a, a good way to raise funds and, and that evolved and there are more sophisticated way and more fair and better uh, ways to raise money. And, and, and I, I believe the same will happen with, with data collection. And, and we will see regulation, but I think unlike the Web2 uh, case where it took like 20 years until we got into GDPR and regulations around data. In these two, 20 years, companies could do whatever they want with the data, and we see all the consequences of, of that. In Web3, I think that the users have more power and protocols because the switching cost is so easy, so uh, projects, uh, protocols, and also dApps will be more accountable to the way they, they do things. And that means that users can decide, okay, I don't like uh, the fact that they collect my data, I will move to another front end and use Uniswap through, through a different uh, uh, application. So I think that kind of uh, alternatives that Web3 brings uh, in favor of users in this journey from uh, state regulation to maybe self-regulation by the market and by the standard that the market will dictate. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, that, that kind of leaves me into um the idea of transparency and um, when is enough of enough. There's certainly a responsibility on the user to um, seek out education and to read the terms of use that are available to them and, and pay attention to, uh, to what they're doing. But where does the does the burden of responsibility start to shift toward the team? And, and what are some best practices for being transparent? Because I think one of the biggest lessons learned from FTX that's a little bit less talked about in terms of um, you know, money is just that, that the team makes a project and um, you can have, people can do something for a really long time and do it poorly. So experience only weighs in so much. Um, so there's certainly like a level of competence and systems administration um, that, that needs to be met for a team to be successful. And I know, Leo, you mentioned that a lot of the projects that you invest in, you try to take an active role in. So I'd love to hear like things that you look for in a solid team, um, but also like what levels of transparency and what efforts need to be made on a team's part to inspire uh, that level of trust. Um, because even in a space where, you know, we're operating on smart contracts, there is still this uh, human need to feel like they can put trust in something that they don't fully understand. Yeah, and, and it, it's a great point because even though we are dealing with like a decentralized technology that reduces the need for trust, we, we all know that in the current state, there is eventually some trust element in probably all of the, the protocols out there. And therefore, the team behind or the, the, the community behind or the people that, that, that make the decision is a key part of deciding which, one, which project you want to back or which one you want to use or which one you want to deposit your funds into. So it's, it, it's true that we are aspiring to minimize that, that risk or, or at least that exposure to, to, to centralize the control. But I think what we, we already see that the technology does reduce the amount of harm uh, a, a single entity or a single individual can make. So project either, either have uh, 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 tools or, or controls that at least require a multi-sig uh, uh, signature, so it's not all in, in the hands of one person, and gradually we see more uh, 
protections or more uh, layers of, of defense coming in on top of it with kind of uh, proactive preventing, preventing or pre uh, proactive uh, notification when something uh, that seems to be malicious is happening within a pro protocol. So these tools also will help to reduce the amount of, of trust you need to put in a certain entity or person. And uh, but it's still a very valid point to know that when you use uh, DeFi today, you still need to be aware that there is a team behind and probably they have uh, some level of control and you want to make sure that uh, you feel confident. But but the way to do it, it's not always by do I know them or not. A lot of this is, is part of the market regulation or kind of market norms. So who are the VCs that invested should be a, a signal because you want to see that there are people that did run some due diligence on the team and did decided to back the, the team who are the prominent community members and, and how much transparent the team is in terms of communicating and bringing the community vote or at least uh, knowledge what happens within the protocol so i think these are key metrics to to be aware of uh, when you want to participate or join a, a, a crypto project and that can help the minimize the risk that still exists there yeah, I think I think also a key there is the idea of, you know, the what when blockchain was created, it was always like this is trustless technology, this is transparent, you can understand everything. Um, but but the apps and the tech that's built on top of this this blockchain um have a lot of other aspects, as Lior kind of mentioned, that are not exactly transparent, right? I think. Today, the thing that is most transparent is anything that you that, that you call sort of on chain, right? Things that you can track based on the trustless nature of the technology itself. Um, you know, when you have these centralized exchanges like FTX, like many others that we've seen, you know, um, fail all of these kinds of audits, um, you, you see, you know, ideas like proof of reserves come up. Um, and, and these other ways to audit the, the part of the technology that's not on chain, that's not actually sort of transcribed on this trustless ledger. Um, and that's sort of the, uh, the area that's a little confusing. You know, beginners come into the space and see, um, oh, blockchain technology, it's trustless, it's transparent, you can know everything, but then you go and put your money on FTX, um, you know, FTX is holding, and, and custodying funds, it's not deploying things on chain. It's not letting people deploy their funds into some type of smart contract directly. It's going through some other wallet that they're holding their assets with. Um, so this idea of trustlessness is, is, at least today, extremely heavily based on what is kind of considered on chain. Um, and, and the importance behind that is understanding what is on chain, what isn't on chain, um, what, what is transparent within a protocol, what isn't. Um, and again, it's, it's another area where we are slowly building out the pieces and the infrastructure that'll make more of these uh, decentralized app experiences possible to be uh, trustless, right? Like Willie said, you know, Shapeshift is working on uh, the aspect of decentralizing governance and uh, this sort of the idea of DAOs, decentralizing the, uh, the, the decisions and making the decisions more transparent before uh, the actual event of transferring funds on chain, which is that blockchain technology transparent piece happens, right? There's a decision that's made. There's people who hold um, certain, um, I guess, spots or, or positions of power within these different kinds of organizations that can make decisions. So how do we get more of the decisions we make and how do we get more of the essential aspects that deal with trust to be more on chain and trustless um, using the tech aspect of it less so than the uh, obfuscated kind of processes that we use today. Um, so that like transition is something that's important to kind of um, understand, especially for new people who just say, you know, a oh, blockchain is is trustless. Uh, now I don't have trust in it anymore because look at FTX, blockchain is is bullshit. It's it's two separate things. Um, so yeah, that's that's probably an an essential piece of the education that you brought up too, Ashley. Right, like helping people understand what is uh, easy to, to, to see and what is trustless and what is transparent and what isn't and where we need to fix those things. 
strongly totally agree with both of you guys. Um, and yeah, if there's, I try to generally try to not be a maximalist about anything, but if there's anything that I'm a maximalist about, it's, it's transparency. I always believe that that more transparency is better than less transparency. I think you guys make great points that oftentimes people assume that like, oh, you're, you're doing stuff in the, in, on a blockchain, that it's got to be completely trustless and completely decentralized. And um, obviously that's not always the case. And that's why transparency is so key. I think it's, um, it's fine if you're not completely decentralized yet. Hopefully that is your goal, but it's essential that you're at least transparent with your community about the, the points of centralization that remain um, or the data that you're collecting basically. And um, ideally like your code is open source and anybody can go and audit that themselves. So there's definitely levels to tr transparency, but being open source and making it very clear to the users what data your collection collecting, who's on the multi-sig, all of that I think is is critical. And as long as you're transparent, then I think it's okay if you're not fully decentralized yet. Um, to your question about like the team, I think it's a really interesting one. And um, you know, there's there's trade-offs, right? And obviously, if a team is fully doxed, then there's a bit more recourse in the event that anything does go wrong. Um, so that can be great to have. But if you have a protocol that's uh, all on chain and the admin keys have been thrown away, then um, I think it can be fine. I think there's a place absolutely for anonymous teams. Um, and we have, yeah, and I look forward to on chain reputation um, evolving so that um, you are able to basically be completely anonymous, but, or at least pseudonymous, but show um, your reputation, your history, the credibility that you've established. Um, so that we can make it easier for people to uh, launch these protocols that can be, you know, um, or that don't require any trust, basically. Uh, that's certainly ideal. Um, and so I, I think it's just because a team is anonymous doesn't mean that they're malicious by any means. Um, but it's even more important, I guess, for those teams to be especially transparent and to minimize as much trust as they can. And um, yeah, just because a team is doxxed, of course, I mean, I don't think I need to teach you guys this one, but that doesn't mean that they can be trusted either. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it can really only help a team and coming into a space where everything is evolving really quickly. There are a lot of obstacles and problems that come up that we couldn't have foreseen because they certain processes haven't existed before. So it really can only serve a project, in my opinion, to be as transparent as possible because you're really inviting the community to come in and help you look out for these blind spots. So if you can kind of take some of the, the ego out of it and and focus on the collaborative growth, then um, your project is likely going to, to benefit greatly from inviting all the eyes onto what you're doing. Um, totally. And be wary of closed source interfaces and protocols because at the end of the day, you're completely trusting that team. Um, you know, Even if their protocols on chain um, and you're using their interface, basically, you, you're absolutely trusting them. So strong advocate for, for open source because it kind of just eliminates that risk and makes everything completely transparent to your point. Yeah, you mentioned something about um, a couple of times you talked about full decentralization. And, you know, I think a lot of people, something I've discovered in this past year is that people have different perceptions of what it's something it means for something to be decentralized. And uh, it, to my understanding, it really exists on a spectrum and everything kind of has to start off under a certain amount of control. Wow. And then slowly, that's like a gradual release. Um, but I'd like to hear your perspective on kind of what that process looks like and what does full decentralization entail? Great question. Yeah, I strongly agree that decentralization is a spectrum. Um, and most projects probably start out more on the centralized side, and hopefully they continue to decentralize all these different aspects, right? And not only is the decentralization a spectrum, but there's, to, to Daniel's point, there's multiple parts of the stack, uh, and you can have points of centralization and failure throughout your entire stack. Um, so like for DAOs, one thing that I, I think is easy, an easy kind of threshold to be considered like a, a sufficiently decentralized is um, whether the community, for example, actually has the ability to execute transactions on the DAO treasury without any middleman. Uh, I think that's a clear, clear differentiator. And there's a, on one end of the spectrum, we have DAOs that are completely on chain. They have no multi-sig. And the only way to execute transactions is for the community to pass a proposal, include those transactions of the proposal, and then execute it all on chain. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have DAOs that have a, a snapshot um, for governance, and then they have a multi-sig. And there's it's entirely up to the multi-sig um, to actually execute those transactions. And the community is completely trusting them to both execute transactions they approve and to not execute transactions that they haven't given consent for. Um, 
Shapeshift is a good example because we're right in the middle right now where we have we do have a multi-sig, but we also have a safe snap and the community can actually execute transactions without that multi-sig. But we have the multi-sig there as kind of a safeguard um, and as a temporary stepping stone towards what we call sufficient decentralization. Um, and it's up to the community. If the community wants to remove that multi-sig, they have the ability to do that without the multi-sig's uh, intervention. So um, yeah, I think that's a good way to illustrate at least one really important um, aspect of decentralization for any DAO, which is that treasury. And does the community actually control that treasury or are they trusting a small group to control it? Um, and from that, yeah, you can imagine that, you know, is the multi-sig, are they docs? There's a lot of examples of like uh, uh, treasuries that have five signers, but no one has any idea if each of those five signers are unique or if it's just one person holding five different keys. Um, so that's another great example of uh, the importance of transparency and how it can be sometimes difficult if you don't have a docs team to, to establish that trust. And why just full decentralization or having no multi-sig is arguably better, but there's there's challenges to that for sure. And we can talk about that if you guys want, but... Yeah, I think that's one big example. Obviously, there's uh, we just had a whole DAO out this past week, which was really cool. And on the note of transparency, all of it was streamed and recorded. If anyone wants to check that out, we had a whole conversation around decentralization, and we touched on kind of two big areas, one of which was our application, um, the Shapeshift app, and the front end is decentralized. We're working to decentralize the back end, and at that point, it will be what we call fully decentralized, unstoppable application that um, anybody can access from anywhere in the world and that nobody can stop. Um, and then we talked about the organization and how we also we have kind of these two missions to fully decentralize the application and to fully decentralize the DAO. Or when I say fully, I think I mean sufficiently decentralized. And it's it's debatable and subjective about where that threshold is. Um, but yeah, we are we're we basically have a whole list of all these different things that are currently centralized. And it's not just our application, but it's things like our Twitter account, basically. Um, like how in uh, our Apple Store account that enables us to publish an app and there's still some things that we don't yet know. How do we transition control of this from a small group to the community, basically? And and then just on one one last thing I'll end with is that um, you know there's a spectrum even just on that community. And uh, obviously, like when we the, the more voters, more participants you have in your DAO, the more community members holding your governance token, the more decentralized everything is um, that your DAO controls. And so that's another thing we think about a lot is how can we grow our number of governance participants? How can we convert each user of the Shapeshift application? How can we help them earn some Fox by using the app um, and convert them into community members and ideally active contributors? Um, we think if we can kind of nail that funnel, that's a really great way to, to further our decentralization uh, as we scale our user base. Thanks, Lily. We are running a little low on time, but I'd love to ask just one more question if, if everybody's got the, the space for it. Um, we, we did talk a lot about how we need more liquidity in DeFi. And I do think that, you know, CeFi is kind of losing funds as they migrate over after the fallout of FTX, which is exciting. Um, but sustainable lending strategies is something that I think we're, we're kind of sorely lacking. And um, right now, I think beyond over collateralization, how can we push maybe some sort of DeFi credit or just make it more accessible to people um, without violating privacy? And, and I think Willie mentioned something about the idea of on-chain credentials and having the pseudonymous um, credit score or identity so that you can kind of vouch for, for your activity in the space. Um, so I'd just love to hear everybody's perspectives on that um, kind of as we round out our, our DeFi chat. I love that we didn't even get halfway through the talking points because everybody had so much awesome stuff to contribute so far. So thank you so much. We'll have yeah, to do you, another one. You saved, yeah, we'll have to do another one for sure. And you saved the uh, sort of deepest, uh, most, uh, I guess, uh, difficult question to the end. Um, I think I think lending is super important, and you know, even as Willie said, right, the in the DeFi space, lending is possibly even easier today um, once you understand sort of the basics and get into the DeFi space. Um, but lending is a uh, is definitely a slippery slope, right? Um, there's all kinds of uh, on and off switch toggles, things that can change um, how much risk you're exposed to and how much risk you're you're not exposed to. Um, and people are learning slowly but surely how to do this in the best way possible, right? Um, I think uh, one of the massive keys to to enabling, uh, you know, a great lending platform is exactly like you said, right? This decentralized identity or on-chain identity that gives you some sort of reputation score or credit score on-chain um, so that people have an idea of, of the kind of user you are. 
um, and doing it in an anonymous way so that it's not, you know, fully identifiable, but at least you have some sort of reputation that, that you see. And I, I think the second piece is um, sort of in, in the traditional lending and borrowing space, uh, you know, if you go get a car loan, you have to uh, provide an idea of what you're taking the loan out for, right? If you're going to get any loan. So a car loan, as an example, right? You go, you tell the bank that you need to take out a loan because you're going to buy a car. Um, because of that, there are certain types of levers. There are certain types of, um, you know, APRs or, or, or different types of loan uh, sort of uh, protocols and, and understandings of how you could take this loan out. Um, if you're if you're taking out a loan on a house, it's going to be slightly different, right? You've taken out a mortgage. If you're going to take out a loan on on anything else, right? It's not that you can go in the normal in the regular world and take out a hundred k loan to go and uh, gamble it away, right? Unless you you're providing some sort of major over collateralization or or something extra. Um, so with that being said, I think the, the idea behind this is that there's some kind of rails or understanding as to where you're planning to take, why you're planning to take that loan out, what you're going to do with it, um, and providing an easy way for, uh, for you to be able to pay that loan back um, as a user and for the, the loanee, right. Or the person who's loaning out the money, um, the ability to know that they are going to get paid back over a certain period of time. Um, so it's a little bit of a wild west today, for sure. I think there needs to be a little bit more, um, detailed and maybe it's not regulation, but, um, you know, smart contracts with, uh, actual smart logic, right. And ideas that enable you to understand, um, why how you're taking out a loan and for for people who are providing money how they're giving out loans in a way that makes sense to them and maybe down the line that means totally customizable loans based on certain um certain levers and certain features that you can build so that you say hey i'm willing to loan out a hundred thousand dollars but i'm willing to do that um based on my own customizable contract um and to certain, you know, uh, credit score people, right? And then everyone can decide uh, what kind of risk they're willing to take, what kind of risk they're not willing to take, um, and provide that those kinds of funds to uh, the people who they're open to to providing loans to. Agreed. I think. Um, uh, yeah, I, I used to like think a lot about how can we solve, you know, and enable fractional reserve banking and, and under collateralized loans in DeFi. And then we had uh, Kate Lamont come speak to Shapeshift back in the day. And she's a stark advocate that you should never have any rehypothecation. It's just a recipe for disaster and loans should always be fully collateralized. And um, I think she made some really good points. And I, but that said, I think uh, to, to Daniel's point, like the demand is there, right? And we already, I, I do think there's, there's a space for these protocols that enable um, under collateralized loans. As long as they're transparent, and I think it's better. Like in the banking world, um, you know, you deposit your money into a bank, and they lend it. They lend it all out right now, and you don't really have a much of a choice as an end user. Um, I think it's at least better if it's if uh, people are opting in and saying, you know what, um, uh, I want to specifically lend to to this party, or you know, I want to deposit into this basket of of loans, um, and it, it's fully transparent on who the the borrowers are, and um, you know, there's an extra incentive. You're not just getting like one percent yield uh for for loaning it out but you're actually getting like double digit yield um and you're getting compensated for that risk and there's some people there's lenders out there that are comfortable taking that risk um and i think it's really interesting to see like um the dow lending space and how um where we actually have this live right now on arbor finance um there is a the shapeshift dow is offering lenders the ability to um to loan to the DAO, but it is fully collateralized, but it's just kind of an interesting example where there's been kind of a whole credit analysis performed and a lot of data to enable these lenders to do due diligence and decide, do, do we want to, to lend to the DAO? But it, that, even then, that's the case of, it's an example of a fully collateralized loan. Um, so yeah, I think there's space for it. I think we'll see the same thing happen. I think in DeFi where, of course, like people are going to default on these loans and just like, you know, even in CFI where it was fully regulated, um, that it's, it's collapsed in the past, basically. And so I think we'll likely see that same thing repeat in DeFi, but at least the difference will be that one, there's there's no one to bail anyone out. So taxpayers' money isn't going to be used to bail out all of these, these lenders that... Um, 
uh, YOLO into all of these opportunities and don't necessarily perform enough due diligence. Um, and it will be opt-in. The money that is lost is from people who have made the decision to, to loan to these under collateralized loans. So I think it's at least will be a better form of the status quo, but I expect we'll see the same uh, collapses that we've seen in the past. And I, yeah, when, when it's very hard to incentivize this stuff correctly and people will act out of their self-interest. And if it's in their self-interest to make as many of these loans as they can to package them up and rehypothecate as much as they can, then I think that's what we'll see happen. Um, but I think it'll at least be better in DeFi than, than the current status quo. Yeah, and I, and I think we've we've witnessed in the last bull, bull run and what happens now that the market is driven by greed. Eventually, this is all based on incentives of people will optimize to make money if they can, and sophisticated players will take the opportunity to make money if they can, even if it's coming on the account on, on others. And the, the beauty of what we can build is that we can build systems that uh, kind of hedge the, the amount or, or even potential loss of someone, for example, lending lending uh, money. That could happen when, similar to what uh, Daniel is saying, that the purpose of, of the, the loan the loan is, is pre-marked and it's also under the control of the same smart contract uh, in which the, the person deposited. So similar to how perpetual markets work, that you open a position, Despite be, it being leveraged at any given point, you can be liquidated if you are at risk of not being able to to kind of uh, meet your your underlying collateral requirements. So the same can be applied on on lending and borrowing markets that uh, will allow uh, lenders and borrowers to to get into positions that are uh, could be seen as under collateralized because people are taking leverage positions, but they are always under control that at a certain point, these positions are liquidated and the lenders are kept whole. And this type of system we've seen, for example, Gearbox is doing it very, very nicely. Uh, Blueberry is now coming up with, with something similar. So we see uh, tools that are uh, built for various use cases, for example, for providing liquidity or different sophisticated market making uh, 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 strategies. And this will be, I believe, the type of uh, use cases we see growing because they will bring more confidence to the lenders on one hand and more opportunities for the borrowers uh, uh, to kind of uh, improve capital efficiency on, on the capital that they are willing to put. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, really awesome thoughts. And I, you're right. I think I sort of uh, <clears throat> just scratched the, the surface of that at the end of our conversation and we kind of run out of time, but hopefully we can do this again. I really appreciate each of your contributions and, and thank you so much for taking the time to join this call. Um, yeah, and I, I look forward to, to, to more. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, everybody. It's great hanging with you guys. I agree. We should do this again sometime. 100%. <laughs>